everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Tech Trends for Marketers, What to Expect in 2023. I'm your host, Jessica Liss, Analyst at Insider Intelligence in New York City, and I'm joined by my colleague, Principal Analyst Yori Wormser in New Jersey. Great to have you here. Hey, Jess. Great to be here. Before we get into the main presentation, I'd like to thank Snowflake for making today's webinar possible and welcome Lorenzo Mello, Product Marketing Solutions at Snowflake. Lorenzo is joining us from LA. Hi, Lorenzo. Hi, Jess. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. A few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We'll email you a link to view the slides and the full recording afterwards, but we do want you to participate. So just use the chat window on the right to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion. So with that, Yori, let's get started. Over to you. Thanks, Jess, and thanks to everyone for joining us on today's webinar on tech trends for marketers, what to expect in 2023. So before actually getting into the um, into the webinar, I just want to set the agenda quickly. We're going to start with the context, just a few slides about what the tech industry in general is feeling these days. That we're going to go through five different trends. These aren't the only trends in technology uh, that apply to marketers, but these are five ones that we think will make a difference in 2023. First, we'll look at connected devices, get ready for commerce. So think CTV or smart home. IoT or connected cars, and how they're getting more connected, more integrated, uh, and more seamless for commerce applications. Second, we'll look at generative AI, think GPT, uh, Chat GPT or DALI 2, and how they will transform dynamic creative. Third, we'll look at clean rooms and how they will become more interoperable in 2023. Fourth, we'll look at uh, Web3 and specifically how as the hype is subsiding around cryptocurrencies, NFT markets, um, Web3 is going to really start to be applied for loyalty. And lastly, we'll look at games and how they may become a training ground for marketers who are interested in, meta in the metaverse. So let's start with the context. And the overarching context is probably something that's close to, close to a lot of you or really strikes uh, home for a lot of you. There have been layoffs. Um, the valuations of some of the biggest companies in technology have gone down a lot. Meta is almost down two thirds in its stock price. Uh, uh, even Apple, which has probably sur survived this year a little better than most, is still down 22.5%. So just a, a big drop in the, in the valuations of these companies, which is shrinking and re rearranging their priorities as they try to become more efficient. Um, at the same time, uh, the VC, div the venture capital deal value has also gone down this year. And that's especially true in Q3. So um, if you look at the chart on the left, um, 2021 was just an incredible year, a record year where over $300 billion of US venture capital funds went into technology. Um, through the first three quarters, uh, of this year, it's still almost uh, 10, 10 billion, uh, I'm sorry, almost uh, $166 billion. So it's um, it's down, but not drastically down. But when you look at on, on a quarterly basis, Q3 is about half, less than half the deal value of Q4 2021, and significantly lower than the 60 plus billion in Q1 and Q2 in 2022. So that's really a sign that funding has gotten a lot tighter, not just through the capital markets, but also through private investments. At the same time, I also wanna make a second point about te technology context. I, and, and probably a lot of you since you signed up for uh, this, this webinar, we're, I'm, a, I'm a tech geek, a technology geek, a geek. I get super excited about a lot of these technologies. Um, I'm an early adopter, but I have to remind myself that most people aren't like that. And if you look at this chart on the left, a lot of the key technologies like virtual reality and cryptocurrency, um, less than 20% of people in surveys are very interested in, in, in those technologies. And even when you add, add in the people who are somewhat interested, you're less than 50%. Uh, and in fact, less than 40% for most of these. So it's something that we have to remind ourselves continuously that people aren't interested in the technologies themselves. They're really interested in how and what they can do for them. And that's really, I think, uh, kind of one of the underlying theme, themes of this presentation. A lot of these technologies in 2023 are going to get away from the hype because the hype's uh, 
with, with funds tighter, people are not buying into the hype as much and are really going to start to be applied in useful ways for marketers. So let's jump into that first trend, which is connected devices get ready for commerce. And the idea of this is really that I, ambient computing, which has been something that's been bandied about by companies like Google and others for years, um, is starting to come into play. So amb the idea behind ambient computing is that we're going to be surrounded by connected devices that connect us in a contextual ways to the internet and even provide uh, proactive messages uh, that are relevant for the moment. Um, and we're just starting to see that that surrounded um, internet, that real world uh, surround surrounding of the internet through um, CTV now, which is uh, the majority of us now have live in a household with a CTV, 230 million users in the US. Connected cars, um, again, the majority of drivers in the US are connected car drivers, over 151 million drivers. Smart home, there are 117.1 smart home users, and those are smart home devices, excluding smart speakers. And when you look at smart speakers specifically, it's another 105 million users. So there's this incredible explosion of IoT around us. Um, IoT that we can access the internet through. And a lot of those are becoming a lot more seamless uh, this year. So smart home, both the speakers and the smart home devices are going to start to adopt this common uh, language called Matter uh, that will let them be integrated better and let, it, let integrations come through some sort of master app or through a portal, a smart screen, or even a smart speaker. So you're going to see easier connections to, through the smart home and easier connections to the different parts of the smart home this year. Um, as matter takes over. The, uh, in terms of connected cars, um, the tethered systems, things like uh, and like uh, uh, CarPlay and, and Android Car, those are um, becoming more sophisticated. But I think more importantly, you're starting to see embedded car systems uh, uh, become more prevalent. The percentage of those is a percentage of connected cars uh, are rising steadily each year. And those are more... Uh, integrated into the car, more integrated into the um, to the experience, um, and will make uh, things like payments easier down the line. And in fact, are already making that as car companies are creating partnerships with with payment companies and payment payment platforms. And lastly, there's CTV and click to buy and shoppable media uh, within TV. And I think that's going to make advertising within CTV more effective and more seamless as a portal to the internet and to commerce. And there is one more technology that I don't wanna point out and that's QR codes, which are more and more prevalent on billboards and digital out of home screens. And with that, they're launching through, because they're there on these screens outside, they're launching uh, new ways of e-commerce. You can connect to a product page, uh, or a, an experience like a video through a billboard. You can activate digital out of home screen so it becomes kind of a second screen to your e-commerce experience. Uh, you can look at products on a larger screen if you're, let's say, in an elevator. Um, lots of different ways to activate it. And I think it'll bring new opportunities for e-commerce. It's not going to change the, uh, it's not necessarily going to change um, how, how much and how many, how we directly interact with these QR codes, but they are going to allow new types of e-commerce. So not all of these sales are going to be incremental. Some of these are going, to, especially the, the ones in the smart home for Matter or in-car are likely going to be mostly incremental. They're going to replace other channels. So um, most smart home sales, um, I think are going to be for replenishment. Um, either through you know some sort of CPG replenishment or parts for your device or a replacement bulb or things like that. In car, right now, the most obvious use case for in-car payments are things like parking or gas that you would pay for anyway. But I think the advertising, uh, the, the new forms of advertising, things like the shoppable TV ads, uh, shoppable media ads in general on, on uh, vid in video and OTT video uh, and in social media, those are going to add incremental sales. Um, same thing with in-car app ads, so ads within apps within embedded systems. 
Um, and lastly, the QR codes on the bill on billboards, which I mentioned, or on digital out of home, I think are going to create new moments for e-commerce and more seamless ways to launch it. So our predictions for this year is, first of all, the partners will make more partnerships. Uh, I'm sorry, car, car makers will make more partnerships with payment systems. They already exist, some of them. Um, there's one between Demler and MasterCard. Uh, but I expect that in 2023, we're going to see more types of uh, partnerships between, uh, between car companies and automotive systems, automotive operating systems, and payment systems. So we'll make par car payments easier. Secondly, shoppable media will grow, um, and you're going to see more ads in CTV, um, both in, in over-the-top uh, streaming programs and apps, uh, but also within social media that's, that are going to present opportunities for commerce. But, I, but at the same time, this is going to be a slow process of getting people used to buying through their TV. So I think 2023 is a start of that process, um, but it's not going to be, I think, suddenly a massive uh, e-commerce portal. It's going to be the start of it becoming that though. So let's move on to the second trend, which is generative AI, which has definitely been in the news in the past couple of weeks um, and how it will tr transform dynamic creative and marketing in general. So I think all of you have heard something about uh, chat GPT this past week or two. Um, it's gotten a million users faster than most of the apps that have become massive apps um, in the past, things like Instagram, um, TikTok, stuff like that. Chat GPT has gotten a million users faster than those, has, created, has gotten a tremendous amount of buzz, like my Twitter feed is just filled with people playing around with it. Um, but it's not the only type of generative AI out there. You're also Dolly 2, the image generation uh, program that came out earlier this year um, generated a lot of buzz when it came out in September. There's video, there's Imagine from Google, Meta has a similar program as well. And there's copy generation from Jasper, um, which lets uh, basically marketers create copy using uh, generative AI and ba basically just automate their, their marketing copy. So you're seeing all types of different applications, all types of different uses um, for generative AI. And generative AI has been getting a lot of uh, venture capital do dollars as well and late round investments. Um, so it, there's just been, as there's there have been slowdowns in investments elsewhere, it hasn't slowed down as much for AI and generative AI startups. People see the value in it. And specifically, you're seeing a lot of adoption within marketing. So right now, um, at the present, according to this um, uh, survey by MIT Technology Review Insights, um, about 20% of marketers see wide-scale adoption um, in marketing and advertising of generative AI um, or, or of AI in general. And five, by 2025, 44% will see, wide, will see widespread adoption um, and 20% see it as critical. We'll see it as critical. So just the majority, almost two thirds of people, will see widespread. We'll see it as wide, widespread or as critical. So just a tremendous growth over the next few years. And at the same time, it's not just in the future. It is here already. This year, uh, according to Persado, about 25% of people will have seen some form of generative con AI content this November. Uh, that went through the Persado um, platform. And that's just one platform. We did some internal calculations here at Insider Intelligence. And just if using this as a, as a uh, base mark, we see maybe 35%, or maybe even more of us have seen some form of gener generative AI content this year, this November. So it's prevalent and it's getting more prevalent every month. Even so, gener generative AI still has some challenges that it needs to resolve. First of all, is around the idea of fair use or property infringement. So a lot of these, and not a lot, all of these models are based on public domain data. Um, so are not and most of these models are, are using public images to create uh, the AI, to sort of train themselves on what to expect from a picture. So if you create an image, through um, Dolly 2, let's say, um, and it it's based on an image from someone else who has copyrighted that image, 
who owns that that generated image that's that's a very legally unclear area right now and that's something that we're going to have to figure out in the next few years shutterstock um has has gone has reached an agreement with openai and is allowing generative ai on its platform get images is being more cautious and has banned them so you're seeing both both aspects right now you are seeing suits starting to form on some of this as well so um, there is a lawsuit right now on for OpenAI um, and Microsoft, the Microsoft subsidiary GitHub, um, and its generative AI product called Copilot. Um, so you're you are seeing some of these suits out there as well. And lastly, um, as probably anyone who's played around with Chat GPT, uh, some of the accuracy may be iffy still. Um, there there's there are some really amusing ways that Chat GPT has gone wrong. Um, and it sounds so authoritative that you don't know when it's gone wrong, um, but uh, many cases of it just coming coming out with incorrect information. It's an incredible program, uh, super interesting. I saw someone say that it's the iPhone moment of AI. I'm not sure about that, but it's incredibly impressive, but it, there's still a lot of issues around it. Um, so our predictions for Generative AI in 2023 is first of all, there, there is a VC crunch in general, but we expect the next unicorn will be a generative AI startup, basically because it's showing its value and it's generating a ton of um, valid hype around it right now. And second, secondly, your marketing team is going to adopt generative AI tools if it hasn't already. Um, these tools are going to become more and more prevalent in 2023. And I think almost all of us will play around with it in some form going forward. So that's that leads me to the third trend, which is clean rooms will become more operable, interoperable. So uh, that raises kind of a basic question, what is a clean room? And I wanted to get an authoritative definition and, and there really isn't an authoritative definition out there. Um, so my colleagues again and I at um, Insider Intelligence came up with this one here which is clean rooms are online environments, um, usually cloud-based, that link first-party data from multiple organizations without actually sharing any personal data. And they come in multiple forms. They, the, the original ones or some of the early ones were walled garden ones, things like Google's Ad Dates, Ads Data Hub and Amazon's Amazon Marketing Cloud. Those are walled gardens really serving their own platform. Um, then you have multi-platform clean rooms like Habu or InfoSum, many others, Merkle. There, there are all types of them out there. Some not oriented towards marketing, some very much oriented towards marketing. Um, they're open to ver a variety of publishers or data holders like credit card companies and other, other holders of data. And lastly, there are clean rooms. There are really frameworks that ingest data from various sources. Um, and two great examples are AppsFlyer and Snowflake. Twenty twenty two was really the year where I think a lot of us first thought about clean rooms as something that we had to have or had to know about. Um, they existed beforehand. Ads Data Hub I think was started in twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. Um, they've been around, but they really took off this year. And according to this data from uh, Lotami, forty eight percent of publishers and thirty seven percent of large marketers use clean rooms already. So that those numbers are very different than they would have been at the early part of 2022. Everyone seems to be interested in in, in data clean rooms for good reason. Um, and that reason is really privacy rules have made the use of third party data very difficult um, right now. There have been both the Apple regulations and Google regulations. Um, most important is iOS 14.5 and app tracking transparency that made sharing of third party data very difficult. But there are also legal regulations. There, there's, there are regulations associated with GDPR and more recent EU regulations, this um, CPRA in California, Virginia's laws, other laws as well. It's becoming harder to use third-party data. And first-party data, uh, a, a good way to use first-party data is clean rooms. Um, they, they are um, really good tools, but they do have some limitations, um, including some that are more perceived than real. Um, there is the idea um, that um, there is a, a valid 
a view that they're not completely interoperable. Um, many of these clean rooms have their own protocols for how to program, program them or work with them. Um, they use linking different linking data or ways of, of using that data. Um, unless you're a large marketer um, and have the ability to learn many of these different platforms, you almost need to, to reinvent the wheel with each clean room. Um, that's not strictly true. Some of these, they're becoming more and more interoperable. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to uh, talk about that more. Um, but there, but the, it's it's a valid point that um, they still are. Some of them are still fairly siloed from each other, and that's especially true of the walled garden ones. Um, second, and this is very closely to, related to the idea of interoperability. Um, there are concerns about privacy. In fact, um, the the same uh, Lotami. Uh, survey found privacy is the leading concern about clean rooms for marketers and publishers. Um, there are standards being developed by the IEB around clean rooms um, that will address things like interoperability, um, coding, and privacy um, that hopefully will resolve these issues as well. And a final concern to a lot of um, that some marketers have is data leakage. Um, the idea that some clean rooms pool data, um, which has perceived risk that one company's uh, first party data could conceivably lead to insights for a competitor. Um, all of these are, are there, there's some grain of truth in all of these and all of these also have solutions coming up uh, down the pike. Our prediction is that better standards and more op operability, interoperability are coming and they will come this year and fuel growth. Um, the ability to port data will become easier and there are gonna be solutions to make that, that, that the linking of data easier. And even for companies that don't have things like first party uh, emails, um, they can use modeled data to, to link up to these um, clean rooms. So you're going to see more companies enter into them. And secondly, I think you're going to see more strategic use cases for marketers around clean rooms, looking at how um, they can look for new trends and for product development or to apply for inventory management as well. So lots of applications that haven't really been tested yet or have been tested incompletely um, that you could use. So I think we're going to see even more use of, of clean rooms down the line. Fourth trend I want to talk about is around uh, Web3 and specifically how it's going to work for loyalty. Now, um, I toyed with um, this trend right now just because Web3 had a really kind of tumultuous year, um, beginning of the year. Everyone's talking about cryptocurrencies um, uh, like Bitcoin and Ethereum or exchanges like FTX and Binance. Um, by the end of the year, I mean, you all know what happened to FTX. Um, a lot of these currencies, the values uh, plummeted. There's definitely a, a hype cycle and we're in the uh, that trough of disillusionment right now around a bunch of these these um, technologies. Same is true really with a lot of the FT NFT markets, uh, the non-fungible token markets. Um, you know, if you're buying a board ape, I'm not sure how, how well your uh, investment is holding up, but the underlying technology of blockchain um, has a lot of value in there. Uh, it's still being, there, there's still a lot of different, um, you know, challenges in, in unlocking it. But I think one way where, we're going to see an early use case for it, and you're seeing a lot of use for it already as in loyalty. So how can loyalty improve, I'm sorry, how can Web3 improve a traditional loyalty program? Excuse me. First of all, basing, basing rewards on NFTs can let owners, uh, let the holders of those loyalty points and that loyalty program have real ownership of those rewards. And what that means is if the reward is in the form of something like a, an NFT that has um, that either could be a collectible, a collectible, or it has a trade-in value, or it has a value that could be combined with others, they can rise and they can actually increase in value or decrease in value, and you can trade them um, for other types of um, you know other things of value. Um, so if you own it, that that becomes an option. Secondly, there are new ways to register or activate rewards. So there, there's the idea of something called smart NFTs. And that means that an NFT um, essentially has a program written into it. Um, so if you have, a, let's say, a loyalty points or a loyalty badge that you earn somehow, um, you can uh, 
perhaps get double value if you walk near a Starbucks. Let's say you have a Starbucks badge. Um, or for instance, you're walking in Central Park and you have NFT, it could launch, uh, give you a, like a special um, AR experience. Um, there, it, the, the key here is that there can, they can be contextually launched uh, to provide new value or new experiences, um, which is a really cool, cool thing. Um, and you can also earn them, earn uh, points in new ways, like scanning a QR code or walking into a store. Things can eat, you know, because they're contextual, they can sort of add uh, almost seamlessly in ways that are um, harder to do with traditional uh, loyalty programs. Um, they're also, and the NFTs can have, have value in themselves. For example, if you have a piece of virtual clothing um, that you bought or did you won, um, that could be something you could use in games or you could collect, um, you could collect badges or they could grant uh, open access to certain rights. For instance, um, if you are on a platform, you could vote on a design that the company is off. You could be a, you could essentially choose which direction or which colors a new product comes out in. Um, so same idea around smart NFTs. It gives you ways of unlocking value and experiences. And lastly, because these experiences can be um, relatively um, uh, gated, um, you can create the idea of community um, where NFT owners feel a kin kinship with other token holders. Um, and really that the, the idea here is something called token gating. Um, so there's there are a lot of different ways these, ver these Web3 tools can add value. You're seeing some programs already apply them. Um, Starbucks Odyssey program is the most developed of these, I think, um, at the moment. Um, it really uh, ties into the existing uh, Starbucks program. It e extends it. Um, it doesn't really replace it. It ties into it. Members can play interactive games. Uh, they can earn collectible journey stamps, um, which are essentially smart NFTs. Um, you, there's then a marketplace for those NFTs. You can trade them. Um, you can combine. You can you can buy them. You can buy ones that actually uh, add more value than they have as standalones. Um, so the cool ways where you can buy and trade. Um, but I think the most important thing is that they they unlock some of these these badges. Um, and experiences unlock um, other experiences in the real world. Things like classes at a Starbucks or trips to a uh, coffee plantation um, in Costa Rica, things like that. Um, ways that you can really um, create unique experiences and unique value through these programs. Um, so our big prediction is that um, Starbucks um, the Starbucks program um, is going to be one that I think really is a model for others since it builds on an existing program. And I just want to just add quickly, I, I jumped too quickly, too quickly from the previous slide, um, that Nike Swoosh, uh, dot Swoosh program is a really cool application as well. That's an application which um, Nike has kind of a unique ability to um, create virtual apparel that people are willing to spend lots of money for. It. They have their own um own platform there uh, that they've created um, that they used to sell on these open NFT markets. They've now created their own marketplace um, called uh, Nike's, Nike Dot Swoosh. Um, people can um, design their own own sneakers there. They can earn money by um, selling those sneakers, earn commissions from them. Um, so because they because they they get that they get um, tokenship of these virtual goods. Um, they they can gain additional benefits from that, including voting uh, and earning commissions. And um, Coca Cola and Pepsi and a bunch of other brands have experimented as well. Um, the last trend I want to touch on is on gaming and how that's going to become a training ground for marketing with the metaverse. And to be fair, this is another one where uh, the hype cycle went crazy in the first part of the year, and now um, kind of. Uh, it's come back to earth and maybe started to dig down a little bit. Um, but a lot of that has to do around uh, Meta's well-publicized problems around um, making money around the metaverse. It's investing billions of dollars each each month on the metaverse. Um, 
and um, not earning nearly as much. In fact, they're losing about a billion dollars a month um, on, on metaverse investments, things like developing new pro uh, new quest headsets or AR or horizon worlds. It's a very costly um, endeavor. Um, but there is a lot of potential here in AR and VR, um, which is real and which still has a lot of interest for marketers. In fact, um, in this survey uh, by Sitecore, this was public. This was conducted in September, uh, released uh, in October. Seventy-nine percent of brands still believe there will, there will be widespread adoption of, the met of metaverse technologies for consumers and brands, and sixty-eight percent of brands will advertise in, in the metaverse. Uh, also, seventy-five percent of brands expect consumers to spend more time in the metaverse than on social media. Now, I think this is the metaverse here is really defined, uh, incompletely defined. I, but basically, I think it means AR and VR and some sort of social layer um, to the internet, um, to all types of the internet. We'll see what happens. But um, there, there, some, uh, some of those aspects are definitely um, strong and gaining, uh, maintaining interest, even as um, some companies that are promoting the, the metaverse are struggling. So where is the opportunity for marketers with the metaverse. I think one big opportunity is in virtual reality uh, and around gaming. Um, when you look at what people are interested in uh, when it comes to virtual reality, uh, the highest ranked answer is around video games, um, just ahead of watching movies. And that that's this is from a global survey. It's also true of the US. It's not true of all of the countries uh, that were surveyed, but it is true of most of them. Uh, the video games is the way they can e most easily envision, uh, the mo consumers can most easily envision using uh, virtual reality. And you're already seeing a lot of gaming developers uh, dive into it. Um, uh, ab about a quarter of game developers already built for VR. Pokemon Go, um, the famous um, virtual, the augmented reality game, uh, has earned $6 billion over its lifespan. Um, that just in first half of 2022. And a lot of the major gaming platforms are aim ad adding both advertising platforms as well as um, these virtual worlds where you can advertise in them. Um, and a good, good example is this from Roblox that has a Chipotle ad um, for Halloween. So our predictions are that new um, mixed reality devices are going to boost interest in virtual reality. Um, a lot of the big companies are still investing heavily in these devices and we're going to see new devices come out this year for Apple, Meta, Sony, uh, a lot of other, a lot of um, Pico, other companies are gonna in, release new VR devices. That should create more, even more developer excitement around VR. Um, and, last, and lastly, economic conditions may slow out in, in, in innovations, but they won't, um, they won't stop it. Um, so we expect that the ads to remem remain important uh, I'm sorry, that VR and, and augmented reality will still maintain interest for um, advertisers that are uh, interested in pursuing them. So what are our key takeaways? Um, I'm running a little behind, so I'm just going to really uh, go quickly through these. Better IoT will introduce new forms of contextual commerce. Generative AI, AI is really here to stay for marketers. Um, clean rooms also are going to get better this year and more uh, uh, uptake. Web3 is uh, having uh, a lot of impact beyond crypto and will make a big impact in loyalty. And finally, marketers haven't given up on the metaverse and will continue to pursue it going down the line. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jess. That was great, Yori. Thank you. Um, and before we get to your questions live, we've had some good ones so far, but please keep them coming. I'd love to bring back in our special guest from Snowflake, Lorenzo Mello, Product Marketing Solutions. Welcome again, Lorenzo. Thanks for having me, Jess. Great, uh, great coverage on those, Yuri. Those that was fantastic. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. So we have a few questions for you, Lorenzo. So let's just dive right into the first one. Um, what do organizations need to do to evolve their data strategies to take advantage of these opportunities? Yeah, I'm ha absolutely happy to cover that. So just to highlight a few, a few examples that Yuri just shared: connected devices, really the IoT component, as data capture devices at their core. Everything to do with the metaverse is, is very much data critical as well. Generative AI will transform really, you know, the, the, the dynamic creativity. 
We know the inherent relationship between data and AI um, and, and really clean rooms. Certainly that's one that's very data centric as well. So there are a few common denominators across all these trends that Yuri just mentioned. And one of them certainly, as you just heard me cover a few of these is data and the importance that data carries. And so these are examples of trends that I think not only use data, but I'd actually go further and state that data is actually the underlying enabler for all of them. And so that without a data, a robust data strategy, it's really difficult to capitalize on these trends. And so when we look at the companies that have thrived during the last couple of years, which I think we can all agree that have been at best defined by uncertainty and, and at worst by real volatility, if we identify what sets these companies apart, it's that they've built themselves a competitive advantage by building a strong data foundation. Um, and defining that in a bit more detail, I'm referring to organizations that today have the ability to capture and control all of their data. They can unify the single source of truth, access it and govern it, and ultimately harmonize it to be able to apply logic to it, right? And so on the flip side of that, you have organizations without this firm data strategy that are setting themselves up really to fall behind, in, in my opinion. So it, with that context, data has become over the past decade or so the real key component of modern competitive organizations and, and really the, the common denominator of companies that set themselves up for success and innovation and capitalizing on the trends that Yori mentioned. And so what, what can companies do about that? How can they develop that firm data strategy? And that's where Snowflake can really help organizations and has been helping organizations for some time now. Um, just to make it really challenging for organizations to build that strong data strategy is that data fragmentation. And so Snowflake does, in, in really in a nutshell, is provide that single repository for all that data that we can make accessible across an organization. Um, and that's a base concept that Snowflake enables, but it doesn't stop there. Um, another characteristic that we see modern organizations doing today is the ability to collaborate on data across an ecosystem. And so it's no longer a prediction that was made, really. That we're kind of very much in the middle of this new era of modern data that's centered around proper unification collaboration capabilities. Um, and so what does this collaboration actually look like? Just to give a stronger visual, which is this component here, what this graphic shows is uh, across, actually each individual organization uh, back in, in Snowflake in April, 2020 on Snowflake is represented by a dot. You fast forward that to 22, you see that growth. So you can see each dot here actually represents an account and each line is a collaboration point. Um, and so you can actually see this view and really just how dynamic and powerful this is with all the data sharing that's happening today. And so if we go to the next one, just to highlight a couple clusters here at the bottom, you can collaborate privately with your suppliers or partners in a really kind of a fully private way. So really touching on, on the applications of clean rooms that Yori mentioned um, and in other ways as well. And you can start seeing these clusters, clusters of organizations really gravitating towards a specific theme. For example, it's no surprise that over the last few years, COVID-19 has had a tremendous amount of gravity in one of the clusters you see there. So you know, this is a really powerful view that shows how this is coming to life a little bit. And to answer your question explicitly, Jess, this is how organizations can really build that robust data foundation. It's you know, really making sure you're, you're aggregating all your data across the enterprise, then collaborating on that data securely across your ecosystem. Great, thank you. And our next question to dive a little deeper into all of that, what do you believe organizations need to think about first to set themselves up for success to build this right uh, data foundation? I think it's a valid question. I think when we when when we think think about what the organizations we talk to that have do that are doing this successfully, it really starts across a few things. Let me break it down into kind of four components. There's an organizational alignment, there are business alignment, there's technology, and then lastly there's execution. Right. So organizational, what I'm referring to exactly is alignment across different teams and specifically across technology and marketing. In this case, they need to collaborate and align on a strategic direction that solves the business challenges through proper technology levers. And honestly, that typically takes top down leadership approach. The second angle around business goals is really specifically about what is inhibiting them from getting that done. The first step is really having organizations see eye to eye. This step's about kind of leveraging that collaboration that exists, coming together and identifying what is really going to move the needle for a business. What are the core use cases to get started on without having to boil the ocean? Third is really the how, right? And so here is where technology teams play a really critical role. It's about really making those business goals come to life through understanding the technology requirements. And then lastly, lastly it's really about execution. So really beginning to put all your data sources into Snowflake and really building that unified view of your customer. Um, so in short, the organizations that we interact with 
and that have been successful in doing those really follow these early steps around organizational alignment, business alignment, technology requirements, and then ultimately execution. Thanks. And lastly, uh, could you share some concrete examples of companies that are leveraging data to advance their marketing efforts? Uh, and what are they th what are they doing with that data? Yeah, and I'll go a little bit quicker because I know we're running short on time, but really let me highlight a couple. Let me talk about Square first uh, in a little bit more detail. They're, they're really implementing advanced marketing use cases with data science and AI. Um, and so Square, as many of you may know, works with merchants that sell whatever goods or services and uses Square's platform for payment processing. And so they did really interesting use cases, but really at a high level, what they did from a data collection standpoint is they looked at merchant characteristics. So things like business type, business size, number of locations, number of employees, geography, et cetera, which can really be typical, like great um, identifiers of, of predictive data sets for merchant behavior. Uh, the second thing is they looked at merchant behavior itself, things like payment behavior or product usage or exposure to other marketing campaigns. And when they didn't have the data, they've actually opted to utilize external data sources to augment their understanding of the merchant. So they were able to put all this data into Snowflake, and then they applied a couple different use cases, one of them on performance marketing. So Square, like many organizations, actually deploys marketing spend across a variety of channels. And it's really important to get that visibility into the return on investment of these campaigns and how to optimize their spend across channels. And so they did this really in two parts. First, they needed to figure out what campaigns were responsible for driving the most signups. And that's really a marketing attribution problem. Um, and, and so really what they did is, you might be familiar with this, it's most common for sellers and merchants to view and interact with multiple touch points. And so they really wanted to identify which ones were driving that success. And then once they figured out which campaigns were responsible, the next part were to figure, was, was really to figure out which campaigns drove the highest value for sellers. And so they used predictive analytics to create a model very early in the life, in the customer lifetime to really calculate that particular customer's expected value. So they're able to use AI to really improve their thinking and, and kind of their, their intelligence around, um, around what merchants were more valuable to them. And then the second example I wanna cover here is around NBC Universal. And this one particularly touches on a trend Yuri mentioned of, of clean rooms. And you know, as, as you mentioned, the advertising ecosystem is, is really facing new regulations and increasing pressure to, to strengthen consumer privacy controls. Um, and many are turning to clean rooms for that. And Snowflake, what we're seeing is this type of collaboration is really transversal across the industries, but it's particularly accelerating in marketing and advertising. And so NBCU built NBCU Audience Insights Hubs, which is built on a cross-cloud data clean room powered by Snowflake, and that ultimately unlocks that data interoperability between Snowflake, uh, excuse me, between NBC Universal and its advertising ecosystem partners. And so in a nutshell, what that, what that does for NBC Universal it, is it allows them to feed their first party data. And, and really that can be used by advertising partners to securely join with their own respective data sets without ever moving, copying, or ever exposing any personal identifiable information in this use case. And so those are two examples, uh, Jess, of, of companies that have built that strong data foundation that are capitalizing on some of the trends that Yuri mentioned. So, so over to you. Thank you, Lauren. So that was all really interesting. Um, now it's time to get into our audience Q&A. Uh, we've received a lot of great questions, so let's just jump right in. Um, so this question is uh, for both of you, I believe. Other than games, are there any other near-term opportunities for marketers in the metaverse? Um, I can I can take that one. Um, so there are a couple different ways of looking at the metaverse. One is as kind of virtual reality, and one is augmented reality. If you look at look at or you know more broadly as um, augmented reality and mixed reality, there are a lot of applications for augmented reality right now. Um, things like social media, masks, and things and areas like that. So I think augmented reality advertising and marketing is going to uh, be an area of growth in twenty. 23. So that's one area. And then there's the whole idea of the metaverse is just adding a layer, kind of a relationship layer on top of the, the existing web. Um, and if that's the case, and I, and I think that's a legitimate way of looking at the metaverse, um, there'll be ways of adding more types of chat functionality or um, personalized interaction on all types of websites um, down the line. I think that may be a, more of a, maybe as generative AI or as um, 
kind of virtual rooms take off. That may be more of an area uh, down the line in 2024 or later. But you know, those are other areas um, that are opportunities. But I'd say near term, it's probably in AR, um, in social media, um, and in some other platforms. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably the, the, the big answer there. Yeah, and and Yori, from my standpoint, I'm no expert on the metaverse by any means, but I think some of the interesting use cases besides gaming, thing, and you mentioned immersive shopping, for example, like things like virtual real estate has some interesting potential as well, right, as an application or even entertainment experiences. I'm personally a, a fan of sports. For you to be able to have that opportunity to visualize a game or view a concert or something without being there might be an interesting way to use some of the technology mentioned around VR and really immersing yourself in some and in some interesting applications and use cases. It's great points. Great. Uh, next question is over towards smart homes and smart speakers more. So um, Amazon seems to be pulling back on Alexa and Echo. Is it a mistake uh, if Matter will integrate the home? So I think... Um... I think Amazon's moving, pulling back or making making some layoffs in that that area. And I've heard similar things out of Google um, around Google Assistant that they may be pulling back some of their investments there. I don't think they're giving up on the platform at all. I think what's happening is it's very hard to monetize um, from from the platform perspective. Um, you know, I, I think of something like um, uh WhatsApp or something like that, which is, you know, everyone's using it, but it's hard to monetize. Um, I think the sim similar type of thing is with Alexa and with virt virtual assistants. Um, that doesn't mean that the smart home is not going to have commerce, um, but it might be commerce that is, um, you know, launched by the individual devices um, and going through some sort of common app. So um, I think the challenge for places, for these big platforms like Amazon, like Google, um, and like Apple that have the virtual assistants is how to monetize the portal part of it. Um, and there are probably ways and I'm sure there are ways, um, but it's it's more of a challenge than they expected. And I think that's why they're pulling back now. So from a business perspective, it may not be a mistake, but it also doesn't mean that virtual assistants and smart home and ambient computing is not going to take off uh, regardless. Yeah, I think that's that's right, Yuri. From just from my standpoint as a consumer and, and a user of some of these products, I I think they probably weighed a few things. Right, the first one, it's at, at its core, it's about hitting those revenue tar targets and the ROI. The monetization point you brought up, they weighed that. They probably also weighed some privacy concerns of having consistently a big corporation more and more inside our homes. And then lastly, the fact that matter does come into the market. In a sense, it actually probably lowers the barrier of entry for more companies to get into the smart home and essentially inviting innovative competition. So, you know, these are my personal point of points of view, but matter does change that in some extent, appears to limit Amazon's scale as a competitive advantage in the market in some ways. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the privacy angle because um they're facing all these major platforms are facing suits about, you know, giving equal access for third parties in, in the marketplace. And that's essentially what you're talking about in, in the smart home. Are you going to give the the other apps, the other device makers equal access to capturing that commerce when it comes out? Great. Our next question uh, is back to uh, on the topic of generative AI. So will chat GPT lead to changes in creative teams and how? <laughs> I mean, that's... That's the million dollar question. I think eventually down the line, uh, there's no doubt the generative AI is going to change with the workforce, um, workforce and marketing and media. Chat GPT right now is not is not at that level. It's going to develop quickly, um, I suspect. Um, I think the, the kind of the near term use of generative AI in marketing is testing sort of um, testing different ideas. Uh, or researching questions um, and getting kind of a nuggety answer for that, for those those questions. Um, and just seeing what what like a crazy idea looks like when it's when it's generated instead of having someone go out and take half an hour of an hour just to jot a paragraph down. Um, so I think it's it's a great way to to generate and test ideas quickly. And I think you're going to see that now. I don't think you're going to see necessarily people losing jobs over it in the short term. 
Um, in the longer term, I think it's it's going to kind of release the creativity of kind of the top performers. Uh, it it may have people have to shift um, shift their skill set though um, down the line. I'm not sure if that's a super satisfying answer, but kind of short term, it's it's um, probably not going to have a huge effect on how how people work. I think in the medium term, it definitely will. Um, in the long term, it could be fairly transformative. Great, thank you. Uh, looking at the time, I think we have time for one more question. So can you share an example of how a brand is meaningfully monetizing contextual advertising that's meaningful for all marketers? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, great question. Um, I mean, I, I think a good, a good example would be um, just stuff that's uh, just just in car, um, some in car ads or suggestions around um, you know uh, QSRs that are um, offering you know uh, incentives when you're in the map uh, functionality. I think that's a really early uh, view kit view into how um, you can make a contextual suggestion um, that's that um, they could generate additional commerce down the line. Um, I know that, um, I, I think it was, I think it was McDonald's or maybe it was Burger King. One of the, one of the QSRs um, had programs uh, that were, uh, that were, if you passed a, um, a billboard, the billboard, it would be a dynamic billboard and it would, um, it, it would kind of reflect um, your interests and be reflected in the ad that you'd see on the screen. Um, so that kind of the billboard and this and the screen in the car um, would would be integrated and you could you could cash in for an offer um, based on it. And that's just very contextual um, in terms of commerce applications. Definitely in TV, shoppable media. Um, you know, you see something on the TV and there could be, and you're already seeing this, you can have an ad to buy whatever someone's wearing uh, in a program you're watching. Um, so that's another example. All right. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So thank you again to Yori for joining us and a very special thank you to Lorenzo and the team at Snowflake. Um, our eMarketer production crew behind the scenes also deserves a huge thank you for making this webinar possible. As promised, we'll be emailing you soon a link to the slides and full recording. And before we wrap up, let me take a moment to tell you what's happening across um, all of eMarketer's media channels. So you can register for upcoming live analyst and tech talk webinars at eMarketer.com forward slash webinars. On the audio side, don't forget to tune in to Behind the Numbers, uh, eMarketer's daily podcast, uh, any, any, everywhere you listen to podcasts. And finally, please check out all our great newsletters. So thank you so much for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your work week.